Well, welcome everyone to this uh, CPC Intelligent Building Group webinar. I'm very sorry for the uh, delay. We had a select today technical problems uh, opening the large file. And uh, today we are very fortunate to have a presenter to talk about uh, what is artificial intelligence when it comes to architecture. So we have Dr. Daniel Ahmed. Daniel is a licensed architect uh, affiliated with the uh, Architectural Institute of Japan. He obtained a PhD in Japan. Uh, her research, dissertation research topic is uh, critical analysis of emerging technologies. And she, he also uh, presented uh, in one of the TED, TED talk uh, organized by Tahuku University. So now all the screen is yours, Daniel. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. we can. We can. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Clemens Krum and Dr. Singh for inviting me to this wonderful opportunity. And uh, let me introduce myself very briefly. Uh, I did my PhD in architecture and building sciences from uh, Tohoku University that I completed last year in September 2021. And my specialism, subfield, or you can say major, was uh, history, theory, and criticism of the emerging technology of artificial intelligence and its relevance to architecture. So this is uh, my specialism and uh, uh, about this presentation, just a very brief introduction that uh, when I was a student at Tohoku University uh, from uh, 2017 to 2021, in the very start, I started gathering some very, uh, because artificial intelligence was in much talk back then in Japan and right now also. So I started gathering a lot of ideas and uh, started writing about them. So it took me two years to publish these three papers that I'm going to discuss today with all of you. And uh, what I can say is uh, these three papers were being rejected again and again by multiple journals, academic journals. And they were saying that they do not publish this kind of research. And then one night in Japan, and it was, UK was like, um, Japan is ahead nine hours. It was 2 a.m. at night. And when I contacted intelligent buildings, International Journal, Professor Derek Clemens Krum. And fortunately, within five minutes, he answered and he said that yes, after 14 rejections, he said that uh, yes, our journal will be publishing your research. And that was a very kind of a exhilarating moment for me. So after two and a half years, my very first paper came in print, and then my second and third with the same journal. And then um, with the rest of the two papers that I published with the leading journal in Japan. So this is how this all started. And uh, today the title of my presentation is What is Artificial Intelligence when it comes to architecture? Uh, Dr. Singh, could you please move on to the next slide? Okay, so uh, the format of the presentation will be on your left hand side, there is a bar and this black sign will be moving ahead as we progress in our presentation. So you can locate yourself that at a particular point of time, we are uh, at what position. So first uh, point is like definition. So they, it is very important for this presentation that I should define some terms beforehand. So not to create confusion or such. The first point is that artificial intelligence, information and communication, cybernetics, heuristics, set and craft theory, machine learning, that is also a subset of artificial intelligence and computer sciences are intermingling. So it is very difficult for uh, us to segregate or to separate these definitions. Uh, the next point is uh, that this study attempts to define intelligence through Marvin Minsky's point of that intelligence seems to denote little more than the complex of performances which we happen to respect, but do not understand. But it may be so with man as with machine that when we understand finally the structure and program, 
feeling of mystery and self-approbation will weaken. So it is this mystery or mysterious qualities that architects or other people seek in artificial intelligence and this is how intelligence is being stimulated in architecture today or through the century. So I'm taking this definition as a source of reference in order to define that what is intelligence and how it is being stimulated. Thirdly, I'm taking architecture as a transdisciplinary field because I have an architectural background. I'm a practicing architect. So history, theory, criticism, visual communication, computer application, environmental control system, or, or environmental psychology, urban design, conservation. There is a whole breadth of subjects that we touch during our bachelor's degree in architecture. So what I believe is that architecture as well as artificial intelligence, both of these are transdisciplinary or you can say cross-disciplinary terms that have a very wider scope and my research exploits this narrative. Uh, Dr. Zink, could you please move to the next slide? Now the scope of uh, this presentation is limited to three of my research papers, as I said beforehand, uh, that were published with Intelligent Buildings International Journal. The first one is, uh, although they were published in 2019 or the later half of 2020, but in print, they became in uh, 2022, 2021, and 2020. So the first paper is Senses, Experiences, Emotions, Memories, Artificial Intelligence as a Design instead of for a Design in Contemporary Japan. The next paper is Anthropomorphizing Artificial Intelligence was the user-centered approach for addressing the challenges of poor automation and design understandability in smart homes. Third one is artificial intelligence and contemporary Japanese architecture. Uh, next slide, please. So when coming to the purpose and significance of this presentation, first the foremost, most important point that you guys will be like uh, wondering about, uh, you will be finding a lot of press of ideas in this presentation and it may seem that these ideas or these gestures are not linking with each other or have no relationship between them. So please be patient. And artificial intelligence, information and communication, cybernetics, architecture, as I said before, are intermingling terms. And my research will be going back and forth between these. So I will be knitting a lot of ideas and generating a lot of questions for my uh, PhD supervisor used to say that you start your paper with a question and you end your paper also with a question. This happens, but by the end of my PhD, when I published my fifth paper, those questions were somehow generating answers as well. So here in this presentation, you will be finding a lot of ideas, random ideas, and a linkage is up to you to be developed in between them. So here on this slide on your left hand side, you see French Minister Malbrecht, Andre Malbrecht. Please, I apologize from my pronunciation of his name as it's in French. Uh, he used to display a lot of photographs, as you can see, lay down a lot of photographs on the floor. And those were random photographs, and he used to establish relationships between them, random photographs. So this is how my presentation is going to approach the narratives of AI in architecture. On your right hand side, there are four photographs. Obviously, they have no relationship in between them, but through the history or philosophy of science, we can attempt to have a relationship between them. But this kind of approach I learned or experienced more when I was an academic guest at uh, Professor Hwesta's laboratory in ETS Zurich during the course of my PhD study. Uh, next slide, please. So the research question that this presentation is going to attempt is what is intelligence and how it is being simulated in the architecture of our cities, towns, districts, um, or even as our very own self. And the narratives that I'm going to pick are the archival ones, that is historical, theoretical, or critical perspectives. I'm not talking about the computational paradigm, for example, as in IBM 
building information modeling, DIMO, IBM, I apologize. Uh, so how it is being implemented over there or how it is acting before uh, as in the background, that's not my concern. So I will be studying, I will be presenting a number of narratives that have been presented throughout the history. And these days I'm researching also from the first century, the historical perspective that can said to be linked to that what was intelligence back then and how it was being stimulated. The same goes for this presentation as well. Next slide, please. So the very first paper that I published with uh, Intelligent Buildings International was uh, Artificial Intelligence and Japanese Architecture, Contemporary Japanese Architecture and Relationship. In this paper, my basic concern was about information utility. And this concept was floated by Yuneji Makuta who is said to be a father of information theory or technology in Japan. And he wrote in his book in 1960s or 70s that got published in English in 1990 and was translated to many other languages as well uh, in a book titled as Managing in the Information Society, Releasing Synergy Japanese Style that in industrial society, the modern factory consisting of machines and equipment became the societal symbol and for the production center focus. In the information society, the information utility, and he defines it as a computer-based public infrastructure consisting of information networks and data banks will replace the factory as the societal symbol and become the production and distribution center for information. So it is this information utility that I researched in greater depth uh, for my this research paper and my doctoral dissertation as well. So I will be talking a lot about this information utility and according to Masuda, it was an infrastructure that was being controlled and generated by computer activities and through networks and data banks. That we can imagine that back then they were totally a theoretical or hypothetical concept, but these days we can experience them as well in one form or the other. Next slide, please. So in this information utility concept, what Masuda and other researchers at that time concluded was that encouraging the policy of uniqueness instead of the factory model that is standardization, routine, and mass production were dictated, and customization was preferred from this information utility model. The second point is of spreading power in order to empower those closest to the decision instead of promoting policies that centralize power in bureaucratic institutions. As we are seeing today that social media has such a power that it can throw away your government in seconds or in days. So back then, 30 or 40 years before, this was being proposed that power, those will be empowered, those individualistic efforts will be empowered as compared to bureaucratic or uh, you can say the governmental institutions. Third point is of permitting people to work at home and to live wherever they choose instead of creating policies encouraging people. Concentrate geographically at education. So we know how in COVID scenarios we worked at home and lived wherever we wanted to. And the last point is promotion of diversity within a broad framework of shared values instead of mass culture. That is of everyone watching the same sitcoms on television. So we, we are experiencing this today as well. Netflix has offered us a lot of opportunities, individualistic choices are available. Back then, they were not. Next slide, please. So here are some of those societal outcomes that I studied that Masuda proposed back in the 30 years before and a lot of researchers as well. For example, on your left, upper left-hand side, you can see a carrier delivery robot that is capable of delivering from postal mail to food items to a lot of things to your doorstep. Next to it is a drone delivery robot by, you can see this cat sign in between over here, uh, by Yamato Transport, and they, do, uh, and they um, propose to deliver postal mail to those remote islands in Japan where Unfortunately, due to earthquakes or tsunamis or any kind of disasters, by road delivery is not possible. 
in lower left hand side you can see pepper it is a very famous robot in uh, japan and i and my son experienced this robot delivering food items in a restaurant and you can order uh, or choose a menu by placing your order on this screen right next to it is uh, children learning english language from robot and then this is a picture photograph of um, an autonomous driven vehicle that was being experimented before the Tokyo Olympics that was scheduled to be in 2020 these are some of those physicalizations in which those information utilities are presenting themselves in front of us these days next slide please so on one hand we have a lot of benefits but on the other we have a lot of disadvantages as well so in this graph that is by free and not phone from the university of oxford we can see on the lower left hand side you can see those professions in architecture that have a very less probability of being automized in the coming let's say 3 or 4 decades and they include architects interior designers even those people uh, where brain is more included imaginary powers or imagination is more at work and at the end of this graph on the right hand side you can see those professions that have a very high probability of being automized such as door fixing tile fixing roofers or serving and leveling technicians so if we say this information utility is being benefiting us on the one hand on the other it is eliminating a lot of jobs and these kind of things are already very much evident in japan when you work there over in the healthcare sector or in the construction industry by the way construction industry 1.23 million jobs have been eliminated already due to this kind of automation over there but in healthcare as more emotion or senses are involved this space is a little bit slow next slide please in my second research paper that i published with the same journal i focused on marshall mcluhan's theory and in then uh, in his theory uh, he says that invention or technology that he names as second nature is an extension or self computation of our physical bodies and nervous system uh, he names as first nature thus rendering man into a form of information and expression that exists in so in one way or the other he says that all these cities sound this ai or even big data internet of things are extensions of ourselves and we are extending these from our physical bodies and nervous system then he defines particularly the electronic media communication technology as an expression of explicitness a translation of one kind of knowledge into another such as clothing housing cities as i said of our skin and bodily organs then the most interesting fact that i came through while reading mcluhan is that he says that these two entities that is the second nature and the first nature has no particular hierarchy orderly sequence but they are ceaselessly subsuming opposing retrieving extending and pouring each other thus hybridizing and message making next slide please in this table that i presented in my uh, research paper uh, i will be reading just the first tab over here for example as club or hammer is a second nature it extends the first nature of our forearm or fist and being a citizen we build with it being a nomad we render being in print it is visually available and being in electronic media it is tactile so i included this a whole lot of table in my research paper in which the second nature extends the first nature and goes to infinity literally McLuhan just stops till the electronic media but i believe we say ai or the other emerging technologies are extending this to infinite paths next slide please so based on this concept of information utility and the second nature extending the first one i studied a number of architects and among them i came across the japanese architect Toyoito. 
you must have heard his name. He's a world-renowned architect, and he has visited a lot of uh, British as well as uh, state universities. So he proposes that museum these days is acting as a computer, and its users, that is we, are within a particular network. You can, it's not about what I believe is only museum, but you can see that Chinese cities are also being a kind of spaces where users or citizens are being in a network. They are needed in a social scenario where they are being monitored 24 hours a day. So what this picture, this, this collage, what I can say is, uh, this place from the left-hand side is, uh, is an exhibition called a City as a Microchip that was exhibited in some museum in New York. And I forgot, sorry, the name of that museum. Next to it, by taking inspiration from this one, next to it, there is a design Sendai Media Tech. And the university I studied in in Japan was located in Sendai, so I used to visit Sendai Media Tech a lot. Right next to it, on the third from left, is uh, Gifu Media Cosmo, another public library in which a lot of public spaces are designed, but in a very different way or format. And fourth from left is another installation, media installation that Toyo did back in 2020 at Victorian Albert Museum known as Visions of Japan, in which he said that we all are saran wrapped nomads wandering in a city where all sorts of information, let's say, readings about weather or political news or any disaster information floats ceaselessly, and we have no control over it. In one way or the other, he was also pointing towards this information utility or the second nature extending the first one. Next slide, please. So here, um, uh, in the third part of this paper, I concluded with the point that us versus Ectroid Android. So we are exchanging roles, whether we are physicalized as in human features or we are transparent acting behind the scenes. So what I questioned was in this paper, that ceaseless subsumption, obsolescence, retrieval, extension, as I said before, acquisition and hybridization of contemporary AI architecture is affecting our cognitive dimension. And while art and technology museums are computers, renting us as their very own components, then are we equipped to exchange our role with them as Android? So with this point in mind, I wrote my very third paper that I'm going to discuss uh, right next week. Next slide, please. So in my third paper uh, that was titled as Anthropomorphizing Artificial Intelligence, I studied literature from a number of disciplines. I read books uh, from authors as in primary literature from the disciplines of artificial intelligence, product design or industrial engineering, human factors, ergonomics, social psychology, communication and sociology, sociological experiments that I'm going to discuss in a moment. And these were, uh, these were incorporated in my paper in order to study the psychology of human thought and cognition and the everyday things these things render and the designer's ability to cater these psychologies of users. Next, I attempted to address a role that a smart home can play as a leisure equipment, device, or object in our lives, granting its user the control and ease of operability they desire. So although I wrote about only smart home, but these days we are also hearing the concept of smart cities, or we can say in a decade or two, we will be visiting smart museums as well. Next slide, please. So in this paper, one of the very foremost primary literature that I came across on human computer interaction was a book by Byron Reed and Clifford Knapp uh, that was uh, titled as The Media Equation, How People Treat Computers, Television, and New Media Like Real People and Places. In this book, the authors argue that people do extend the same kind of etiquette and ethics to artificial things such as to computers, to your tabloids, to your cell phones, 
as they do in real life situations with real beings. For example, they pointed towards a number of characteristics, humanistic characteristics such as politeness, interpersonal distance, flattery, most importantly, uh, judging others and ourselves, personality of characters, personality of interfaces, rural, gender voices, etc. And they argued through very small controlled social sciences experiments, sociological, sorry, experiments that politeness, that if I'm extending politeness to my colleague or my friend, so I'm going to do the same if a computer asks the same kind of questions to me. Next slide, please. For example, the methodology that they adopted, and I picked that up and referred to in my paper, was of, for example, you can see this sentence on the right-hand side, just below the example uh, heading, that when a person asks another person about her or himself, she or he will give more positive responses than when a different person asks the same questions. That's true. We do this in our everyday life. So they replaced this person word with computer. And then they experimented and they found it true that when a computer asks a user about itself, the user will give more positive responses than when a different computer asks the same question. And then based on these two statements, what I did was I replaced this computer word with a smart home. And as it was a theoretical proposition, I didn't conduct any experiment, uh, didn't conduct any experiment, but it was like just a fun way of presenting your thought process in a research paper. So when I replaced this computer word with a smart home, then it became a smart home ask the user about itself, and the user will give more positive responses than when a different smart home asks the same question. And then I came across a number of case studies being done at ETS Derek, and they proved this fact literally, that when a home asks that how am, how am I performing, its user says you are very good, and then when the next smart home or the neighbor smart home asks the same question, the user gives authentic answers or the facts that they are experiencing in their real life. So this social rule still applies as people, users, subconsciously extend the same social etiquette to smart homes or smart cities, or we can say we can extend it to smart museums as well, as they do in case of other humans. So this is what my third paper was based on, and I included a lot of examples on these three factors, like as in flattering, or as in praising, or as in good versus bad kind of etiquette. Next slide, please. So in my fourth paper that was published in Japan uh, with Aldo with Taylor and Francis, but it was published with Journal of uh, Architectural uh, Engineering in Building Systems, if I'm not wrong, uh, the name may vary. Uh, it was like the same kind of spaces that Masuda envisioned, like as an in information utility or as in human space, as in extending the second nature, uh, the second nature extends the first nature or as the uh, Reeves and Nass projected in their book, that we extend the same kind of etiquette to not only our gadgets, but also to our spaces as well, was more elaborated in my course paper. And here I argue that, for example, as an in index museum that was by Patrick Gaddis, and he wrote about it, and he studied this building in, uh, located in Edinburgh, that he labeled a particular kind of a building as, as you can say, a living being in which Encyclopedia Graphica was uh, proposed, um, an encyclopedic methodica with things and diagrams instead of words were speaking, with specimens instead of types were evident. And so museum, gallery, library, college, or any kind of function was amalgamated and transformed into a kind of an essential expression into one intelligible whole. This is the very same concept that Gaddis proposed in 1890s, I believe, and next it was followed up in uh, first in Centre Pompidou 
in Paris and then also in uh, Japan World Exposition Osaka 1970. And we find these kind of spaces incorporated by architects in these kind of structures. Next slide, please. So coming back to where we started, Malbrecht's museum without walls was such an attempt in which this French novelist, art theorist, and France's first minister of uh, cultural affairs proposed in his Saley Musée Imaginary written in 1953 that a museum lineates all those museological entities as pure sources of information, irrespective of their color, proportion, context, function, it can be any kind of, for example, religious, and the period in which they were produced. So coming back to the same point, that these kind of information technology, such as we can say artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, or big data, are eliminating the functions that we used to have during the industrialized world, or industrial revolution, you can say, and they are proposing something newer. For example, making linkages in between those things that used to be segregated in the past. For example, at Malbrecht said in the start of the presentation, we discussed that all lot of photographs, just segregated images, no linkages in between them, but he used to establish those in his mind. And the same work that is being done in uh, Professor Vesta's laboratory in Zurich, ETH. So this is what my proposal was on us. And that's why I was accepted to visit that uh, as an academic guest. This is what I propose as well that not only my research papers, but my current research focuses on the historical narrative, speaking that how different functions are losing their meaning or lost their meaning in the past. For example, let's say from first century, and the number of proposals that I'm discussing are from Remenlal or by uh, Paracelsus or by Jacques the Wokensen, or these days, uh, last week I was studying Charles Savage, that how these people, while intentionally or unintentionally progressing towards information technology is eliminated these boundaries between not only technological artifacts or information artifacts, but in information inspired architectural spaces as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That's a very, like a Derek mentioned in the chat area is exploring a very deep uh, meaning of intelligence. And uh, thanks for your listening and the patience. And uh, you can type your question, questions in the chat area. Please feel mm -hmm. free to test your question over there. Or if you can raise your hand or type your question in the chat area, I'm sure Danny will be very happy to answer your question. And uh, I saw one uh, probably from this one first, the last first, uh, is Abu Bakr Muhammad mentioned about <clears throat> mind body dichotomy is uh, only uh, in the Western culture, but is increasingly questioned in the contemporary scientific approach to what to understanding AI and then the computational framework doesn't recognize the mind separate from the body. Uh, do you want to comment on that, uh, Daniel? Uh, yes, because uh, if I got the question right, yes, there is a very big difference that exists between the Western world and the Eastern world. And yes, he's absolutely right that in non-Western context, there is no segregation, not even between the human mind and the body, but between the um, those things that we can only experience, not through our senses, through some ephemeral kind of a thing. As uh, I'll give two examples for this. Uh, when I was in Japan, I studied Toyo Ito in very greater detail and visited his office in Tokyo also. He also talks about a lot of things that we cannot see, we cannot have access to as in physical beings, but we can experience only, or we can have intuition about only. And right, I, I read his philosophical theories as well about this, and it all comes from Zen architecture or Buddhism. The same goes with the Islamic world as well, that there are a lot of things that are not explainable through words. 
the same I experienced, as I said, in Raymond Lowe's uh, uh, theories, that he was inspired by some Islamic philosophers back in 11th, 12th, or 11th, 11th or uh, 12th century. And he used to say the same kind of things, that all these things are intermingled and it is not necessary to be like in a confined confinement of human mind or body or any kind of restraints. He used to have this kind of thing and, and this thing is being exhibited in the Western world or being promoted in the Western world right now. We can see that in a lot of exhibitions that are happening these days. So they are, maybe, they are approaching the global south in this way. I'm not sure, but yes, this question is right. Okay. Yeah, and uh, can you see the chat uh, text at all, uh, Daniel? Uh, I sorry, think, thank uh, you. Please say it again. Yeah, can you see the chat area at all? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I have uh, this yeah, chat area on my right hand side. Yeah, probably I can close this sharing and then you can see the chat area. I think uh, as uh, uh, Abkara. Abubakar mentioned is responding to Derek's question about mm -hmm. the interpretation of AI and which is accounts for both brain and mind is really physical and something the metaphysical is a, a something is will subtract thinking. And Derek also mentioned about monist and dualist view. Mm -hmm. And how do we account for feelings? Ah, sorry, thanks for cutting you. Yes, that's, that's a very interesting topic. And when I was uh, in a conference at the University of New South Wales back in uh, 2019, there we debated the same thing, that how to synchronize or harmonize this notion of um, segregation, let's say, between the Western and the Eastern world, where these kind of views are being amalgamated again. Um, Again, I will be giving the example of, uh, let's say, the founder architect, modern architect in Japan, Kenzo Tange, or the British architects such as Cedric um, Price or uh, the cybernetician Gordon Pass, that their views also somehow are about like how these, uh, these unsaid or unexperienced things can be physicalized in the physical world. And Toyo Ito attempted these through neon signs, through he attempted to find those notions around him in a highly industrialized city of Tokyo back in 60s, 70s, or 80s when there was a higher economic growth and uh, skyscrapers were popping up as, as you can, uh, you can um, correct me, happening right now in China, in Beijing or Shanghai. So you can find answers to these kind of questions in your surroundings as well. And then there remains a philosophical debate about it. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, the separation of mind, a flow of hormones, and awareness original origin of consciousness. That is also a very interesting uh, debate. Uh, I think Richard Bowman asked about predictions of sportsmen. They can be ready at the right time and the right places. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yes, and uh, uh, the other thing I can say, like, if you have, uh, if the listeners have any kind of any question, they can approach me uh, through my email address that is mentioned on all the research papers. They are all publicly available, so you can mm. access my papers through my name, and you can. Uh, I would love to hear criticism on my presentation as well, because what I believe is I am in a very early career stage and I'm establishing myself as a researcher in AI and the subfield it um, tangles with. So maybe my some of my answers will be superficial, not in greater depth, but if you approach me through email, I would uh, be referring you some books or some, I would be mentioning you or referring you to some professors who are more knowledgeable than me, half are knowledgeable in this kind of uh, philosophical question. Yeah, there is also a question by Michael asked whether your uh, slide will be avail available after the seminar. Do, do you mind to share your slides later on or they can email you asking for a copy of your slides? Uh, I believe that these slides are just 
uh, superficial or they just uh, point towards some basic points in my papers. So it would be better if you can read my papers. They are in more greater detail. So mm. all of this stuff is published already in my papers and they are already accessible. So instead of going for just superficial knowledge, please just consult the papers and you will be finding a greater discussion over there. Yeah, that's great. Yes, yeah, all the all the three papers published in Intelligent Building International. Intelligent so that Building, is great. yes. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, uh, Derek, do you, want, do you want to say something? Oh, uh, yes, I was <coughs> very interesting, Danielle. Um, we could talk for hours, I think, on many aspects mm -hmm. of what you've uh, spoken about. Uh, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, um, in our buildings, it's very important to look at how people react to the environment around them. And now we have many more measurement techniques that we can use the human being as a sort of uh, measurement um, point in the in the environment, not just the atmosphere and the materials and so on. Uh, so how people feel, because we learn then that how they feel in the building is a great motivator for them in doing their actual work, you know, the thing they're going to do in the building. Um, and I wonder how you feel about the role of the user, the, the you know, centric user design <coughs> idea um, of understanding how people respond to their environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Femstrom, for this question. It's a very interesting one. And again, it has multiple answers, but I will try to answer it in the Western context. When we say that a user is one who defines all sorts of notions around him or her. So it is the user who defines all this, and all these technologies are in self, foundationally, nothing. So as as I gave example of uh, Frederick Gaddy's museum uh, in Edinburgh back in 1890s, he used to say that it is the user who defines a particular place and it is a user who tells us that what he wants or what he wants to do or how he will be utilizing or defining a particular technology, particularly in architecture as well. So it, 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 it's all based on the user as in the Western context, but if you go for the Eastern one and we say that no, the user is not the sole authority in charge of um, her or his surroundings, then a lot of debate comes in. And that's, that's very difficult. But because I, um, I tried to study some philosophers in this context, and they just went out of the spent. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't able to understand them thoroughly. But yes, I'm trying to. Mm. So. Thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, sorry, I apologize because uh, maybe um, I'll be answering in some other context, and your question will be some other thing. But <laughs> I'll try my best to answer as as approximately as possible. Okay. Any other question? Okay, read your paper then. It's more interesting uh, analysis over there. It's very deep, kind of uh, just uh, uh, as Derek mentioned, discuss discuss about uh, discussion about the intelligence, and then then we we talk about artificial intelligence and uh, intelligent building. So what is offset to artificial intelligence of the intelligent building? What is inert aspect of intelligence of intelligent building do you mind to expand a little bit more on the biomimicry or nature-based type of intelligence in your in your research or you have kind of avoided that stream uh dr Singh, i have not uh, touched this uh, kind of a topic up till now in my research because I'm more focused 
towards like how intelligence has been stimulated over the centuries my sense is that intelligence was present over the centuries in architecture and whatever was built as based on mcluhan's theory was our, our very own extension so nothing was there to be built on its own so it was like built by human beings and they were intelligent so they were transferring their intelligence to their building for now my sense has been and i'm researching the archival records um at different universities regarding like how those thinkers or you can say those technology makers those gadget makers in research that what the intelligence will be in the future as projected or uh, portrayed with their artifacts so this is my like research right now so I, I would love to but uh, in later stages of my career thank you many many thanks are there any other questions We couldn't hear clearly uh, now. Couldn't hear clearly, but uh, Derek put this uh, paper INBN Intelligent Building International Journal Issue 1, 14, uh, uh, part two, 2022. Yeah. Okay. One from the 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 and in the way that this is in the shape of British society. Others will be reflecting on the change of monarchy, uh, seeing Charles III, and wondering what that will be. And so David Attenborough still will be with Robert Hartburn, and so David, if I may say so, you were born within a few weeks or so. Okay, I couldn't hear it clearly. Can you hear it clearly, uh, Daniel? No. Uh, no, Doctor, I think it would be better if he can type uh, this up for us. And... No, I couldn't hear clearly. OK, that's great. I think the uh, CFC organizer recorded this video and it will be made available to you through uh, CFC web, uh, the new website, and also will be available on YouTube as well. And the paper, uh, I think you mentioned already over there, and probably you can put a link. Uh, to the paper over there. OK, any other questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Singh, I would uh, request uh, the listener, if he is able to, he can message me or he can type in the chat because yeah. we are not being able to hear him clearly. No, I can't hear anything now. Mm. Yeah, if you we couldn't hear anything, but uh, yeah, please feel free. Yeah. Uh, Derek, I saw you raise a hand, but I... Yes, well, it, it's near at the time now to, to finish, but uh, I just wanted to say uh, to Danielle, thank you very much for a most interesting paper, and we look forward to uh, collaborating with you further uh, via the journal and also via the IBG group, um, because you're raising a lot of problems that often <laughs> Are glossed over and um, uh, I keep on saying that as our vocabulary increases in our industry we're using words uh, without perhaps thinking of their deeper meaning and I, I, I'm just tracking as you're speaking um, you mentioned the transdisciplinary nature of architecture and I think that is true. The interconnections between us all, we're too pigeonholed, I think, nowadays with being an engineer or being an architect. And I was thinking of Vitruvius, and you laid out uh, the education for the architect, transdisciplinary architect. And of course, when you read uh, Vitruvius, you, you see very much that 
uh, architects or engineers, he didn't distinguish so much between them in those days, should be uh, educated in a wide span of subjects to cope with the various social, cultural and technical problems that uh, architecture uh, arises. And if you then go forward to Sir Ove Arup, when he was setting up his firm Arup, the, the one word that he emphasized so much was collaboration. And, you know, the collaboration is, of course, because he saw the differentiations made between architects and engineers as being um, a little bit artificial. And um, uh, so uh, you can see we're going full circle. We've gone through the Victorian age of specialization and separate institutions and so on. Um, but I, I wonder if you feel we do that a little bit too much and there should be much more uh, interaction across the sectors, the transdisciplinary nature of, of what we do should be brought out more than what we actually do. We tend to go into little groups of separate groups rather than working together. But anyway, I, I, I don't want to hold up the proceedings. Um, that's something we can continue to talk about. But uh, from my point of view, having been involved in your uh, journal uh, papers, uh, thank you very, very much for this afternoon. It's so interesting. And I'll hand back, back now to Jan for conclusion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chemistrom, for your suggestions, and you have always been a mentor. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be in contact with you. Yeah, let me keep in touch. Yeah, sure, Dr. Okay, thank you, everyone. Look forward to see you again. Bye-bye.